All right, all right. I'm glad you guys are here. It is 6.30 and we are going to hit the ground running. Let's put our timers on. For 7.30 and we will have a hard out at 7.30 um, because that's just the way I roll. I don't want you to feel like you need to be here longer than you need. If we actually go through everything within uh, the hour will end early, but if we don't, that's okay too. If you have any questions, please put them in chat. If you don't have any questions, I'm not worried. <laughs> we can answer questions together, okay? Um, I hope you're having a great day. And let's get to it. I do apologize for, uh, um, I don't know what I apologize for, actually. <laughs> I appreciate you guys were here. <laughs> let's see. Okay, let me share the screen. That is not the screen I would like it to share. Did you want to say hello to everyone? Come on, Baba. Say, come here. Say, hello. We had a bath. What else do we say? We say, we say we like the kisses and the snuggles. Huh? Oh, ho, ho, ho. What, did you want to tell them something? What do you want to say? What do you want to say? Do you want to tell them what you did today? Nothing. Is that what we did? We did nothing. You took some nappies while I graded some papers and did some curriculum review and some other things and dissertations and yeah. Okay. You want to go play? Go get your elephant. Okay. She smells so good because she did get a bath. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Let's jump into it. You can, you can sit on my lap. Okay. So we're going to be talking about communication and contracts this evening. It is 632. If ever there was a time to dive into it, it's now. If, however, I kick myself out, it has to do with the fact that she has a little wet nose and she's tapping on stuff right now. Sister, Baba Ganoush. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, here we go. Let's get into it. I'm going to share the screen. You guys know how I do. I just share the whole screen. All right. And we'll start with communications, which is types of fraud. And then we're going to go into um, listing agent case study on contracts. You do have the link. Yes, you do. It's the Google link. Okay. So for the Google Drive. And um, yeah. All right. Cool, cool, cool. So communications and types of fraud. So the first one I want to talk to you guys is it's actual fraud. Uh, you're breaking the law, right? So actual fraud is an intentional misrep misrepresentation, a representation which suppresses and or distorts the facts, making a promise with no intention to follow up. I think we all know what actual fraud is, but for the state exam, I want you to be clear on the terminology, the, the term and the death, but the term and the definition, but the, uh, the T and the D, right? That's what we say in class. Exactly, exactly. So that being said, um, I wanna encourage you guys to always make sure that you can identify the differences with fraud. So let's look at the example that we have in one of our, um, when, on one of the textbooks. Um, telling a buyer that the roof of a property is completely fine when we know, in fact, there's a problem, right? And if we know there's a problem, that's a problem. So what should we do? What would you do as an agent? Because now we have to bring the future into the present. And I need to call each one of you licensed agents because we cannot look at our, our education, our prerequisite education from a clinical perspective. We have to put it in first person. We have to look at the situation when I say, well, what would you say to the judge when you go to court? I want you to think about the fact that you might be standing in front of a judge or an arbiter, or there, you might, you're going to need to go to mediation first and foremost. But the reality of the situation is we have to put ourselves in those positions in order to understand, I feel a little bit better about why this information needs to be retained. It doesn't have to do with the fact that um, it, it's just in the exam and you guys have to uh, take the state exam and you have to know this information. I want it to be retained so that as time progresses and in life, you're like, oh, I do not want to be 
um, in the in the court for any reason under the sun, other than maybe maybe you decide to become a judge or part you're part of arbitration or mediation. Okay. So if an agent said something like, don't worry about the roof, if you buy the house, I'm totally going to fix it. It's not that big of a deal when in fact, we know that this exact same agent, they're not going to be doing any of what they just shared. At that point, it's not just actual fraud. It's you're burning a brick. You're, 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 um, you're playing with fire is what my mom would say. So when we're in a situation like this, we really need to, and what I mean is you're not the agent doing this. You're seeing that an agent's doing this. You need to go directly to your broker and just say, hey, I might be completely wrong about this, but I'm concerned and then share the concern because the, the kicker to all of this has to do with the fact that a lot of times agents get away with this kind of stuff because the other agents in the office know they're doing it. But they're just like, oh, well, it's not my, it's not my, you know, my place to judge or whatever. No, no, no. But, but if another agent is committing actual fraud, exactly. It's going, it's a, exactly. It's a, it's a watered down effect. We are not the agent on any of these files. Our broker is the agent. We may be doing the pounding of the pavement and the drip um, marketing campaigns and walk, knocking door to door, doing all of those things in order to, to get the business prospect to get the business, right? But the reality of the situation is our license, so this is the broker's license, right? And our licenses are hung under the broker's license. And because they're hung under the broker's license, it's imperative that if we see someone else that's hanging under the same license with us that might be doing something that's not necessarily okay, go talk to the broker and say, hey, am I wrong? Like, what, what can I learn from this? What can I be gleaning from? this situation. And then chances are the broker is going to go, I appreciate you saying it. If the broker loses their license, what happens to your license? Yes, you're, you're not necessarily going to lose your license, but you're no longer going to be able to do business because the license, your license was hung under is, is no longer there. So you no longer have that. You know, how I always say like, it's for the greater good. My arms will be down. You can't see my arms per se, but uh, in that same respect of that umbrella, the umbrella, the covering is missing and you have no, you're not hung. Your license is not hung any place. And now you've got to go find a broker. And they're like, oh, well, where were you working? Oh, we were working for um, John and Jane Doe real estate. And they're like, oh, it's a blight on their, uh, that license concern is going to go with you. So these like protective precautions are like, and I know, I, yeah, I'm with you on that. The, when students say stuff like, well, I don't want to be considered a snitch. No, no, no. Well, you can just ask. You could go talk to your broker and say, hey, am I missing something? Like, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable about with, with the way I'm hearing some stuff being said. How do we navigate this? Let the broker walk through this process with you. You might, before saying something to the broker, want to walk into that agent and go, dude, I don't want to lose my license. I don't want the broker to lose their license. I don't want to get audited. Can we like find a happy medium on how to handle this because I'm feeling a little bit like you might be doing actual fraud and have that conversation with that person. I would always go to the broker. I, I'm, I agree. I totally agree. I, I totally understand what you're saying. I understand when uh, the perception of no, you know, like the, the focus you're already, you're right. You're already focusing on what it is that you have to get done. How are you going to necessarily see what um, other people are doing and the like. I get it. I'm just saying that there are these moments, okay? So that's actual fraud. Let's talk about negative fraud. Anybody in the class heard of that? Okay. <laughs> you're lying through, basically you're lying through omission. This happens when somebody does not disclose a material fact in order to get somebody to enter into a contract. So you're, you're not really telling them everything about it. You're just hoping you can get a ready, willing, and able what? Yes, buyer, ready, willing, and able buyer. A client asking, are there any issues with the structural uh, structure of the roof and an agent not sharing what they know? Now, if an agent does not share what they know, yes, fiduciary duty. And for those of you that are like Kathy, it's fiduciary. Well, I don't like to say fiduciary multiple times a day. So I say fiduciary. Um, 
we as agents, we're, we're basically mandated to tell everything we know about a property, right? First and foremost to our principal. And that's the person that is our client that, and I always say the principal, like, it's like, you're, you're looking up to, but you really have to put them on a pedestal per se, because they're the ones that you're protecting. You're the specialist, right? And because you're the specialist, you're protecting your client's best interest. And so there are three, um, okay, we'll get there in just a moment. I know you guys are, and I appreciate you guys that you guys are yelling at answers. I totally appreciate it. I love it. I love it. I love when you guys are so engaged in class. When it comes to agency, I was trying to say, you've got your principal, right? You've got the agent or your broker, who's the agent. And then you've got, yes, the third party. So because of agency, our fiduciary duty is to our principal first and foremost, right? Then it's to the third party. We need to be honest with them. So what's wrong with this negative fraud situation here? Yes, absolutely. You cannot seriously think that you've done everything you needed to get done. Yeah, exactly. It's your fiduciary duty is now at, you're at risk of, 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 well, you're more than at risk. You have, you've broken, I guess you could call it the cardinal rule of real estate, which is you are to protect your client. You're also to be fair and honest with the third party. So if it's the third party that's asking the information from you, you still can't be sly as a fox. You've got to be honest. Yes. Thank you. Okay. There's constructive fraud. And you're like, Kathy, how many frauds are there? There are a lot of types of vanilla ice cream too. Okay. Constructive fraud. Constructive five is lying without knowing that you're lying. You didn't intend to deceive. So it's constructive fraud. An example, an agent shows a home with a roof problem and the clients ask, are there any issues with the structure of the roof? And the agent replies, yes, it's fine. The roof's great when the roof, in fact, has a problem. So how would we fix this before getting to constructive fraud? Okay, keep going, keep going. Okay, the transfer disclosure statement, the seller of the property. If we're listing this property, the person that is that owns the property is going to tell us everything they know about the property, right? And if we know there's a problem with the property, it'll be a not only... Uh, disclosed in the disclosures, but part of our job with our broker, our broker is going to have a standard list of disclosures for the seller and a standard list of disclosures for um, if we are going to represent a buyer. Now, if your brokerage does not do that, maybe what I'm saying in class right now is maybe it's time for you to build that for your class, uh, excuse me, for your brokerage and submit it to your broker for approval. And then your broker was, is going to be like, you're amazing, right? And the broker is going to be like, oh, where have you been all my life? And you're like, I've been in the, the next office over. Or if you're like very literal like that. Okay. So that being said, there are a list of disclosures and there are a list of questions that chances are your broker already has set up or questions you know that need to be asked of the seller. When was the last time you had the roof checked? Do you have a uh, roof certification? How old is the roof? When was the because you're going to be able to identify these concerns. You will not have to deal with constructive fraud on this side of things. Right, yeah, maybe. But when we ask the right questions of our clients, what are we doing? Building rapport, thank you. You're building rapport with the, um, not only your client, but you're also in this process of asking questions. If you're not the listing agent and you're the procuring cause, you're the one that's bringing the buyer in. When you're asking questions of the other agent, you're building rapport with them too. And what is the, there's so many things that I ask you guys to remember, and I appreciate everything you guys throw out there. It's awesome. We're here to build our community, our, our niche market, right? Our, uh, our circle of friends, our tribe, if you will our village, whatever you want to call it, okay? We're here to build that out. And in this relationship with our client or our principal, the third party, their agent, our broker, and the, the other people that we work with, it should be based on honesty and integrity. Now, if, you don't, if you're not honest and you don't have integrity, it won't be based on that. It'll be based on not that, okay? All right, so let's, talk about this. 
the agent thought the roof was fine, right? What should we do? Let's get a roof cert. When we're listing a property, when was the last time you had the roof checked? Have you had any leaks? Are there any leaks? Can you see like, and I've had people say, yeah, I bought this house and they had beautifully, they, they had just painted it and it was in beautiful shape. And then there were, um, you know, a little bit later on, you could see these, these water stains uh, appearing. I'm like, well, they don't appear in one year. That's over time. And so I would venture to say that there probably is a leak or they've had their roof fixed and we have a roof cert and there's a leak this coming winter because whoever did the roof might have accidentally punctured, punctured through uh, the protective layer that's supposed to keep water out. There are those kind of things that happen too. And with a licensed contractor they have a bond they have and what i mean by that is not a bond with somebody else they have a like we have errors and emissions right yes they have a bond where you can reach out to them and say hey we know you have a bond we need you to come out and get this work done we don't want to you know find out you know feel it out feel out the situation absolutely always feel it out just like don't throw them under the bus we're gonna contact you it's like no 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 let them prove to you that um they meant well and and you're not going to hire just somebody off the street, right? You're going to hire a licensed person. Absolutely. All right. What about negligence? Negligence, negligence, failing to perform a duty or an exercise um, or to exercise a reasonable level of care in said situation or a situation or a experience, right? in the moment. So a lack of time, forgetfulness, or just plain laziness. And I'm going to say that since you're, I'm, we're calling the future in the present, right? You're licensed agents. I'm going to say for the sake of the court, that they're not going to let you as the licensed agent get away with saying, my bad, um, lack of time, dude. Like, I was getting my nails done or whatever. And then I don't know why I turn into these like strange characters, but you don't have a leg uh, in that kicking race or, or, or you don't have a leg in the race or you don't have a, you have only one leg to kick or whatever the kicking in the, what you, you are not in a position to talk to the court in that manner. You better just tell the truth, suck it up buttercup and hope that you don't lose your license. How do we get, Exactly. We don't even get to negligence, right? But I will say this. There's a lot of people in the industry that work very hard and they have long hours and they are powering through constantly. And negligence is something that could happen. So we need to have grace for ourselves and forgive ourselves if we do take more time on things than ne are needed. And then we also need to make sure that the people that we're working with if they're putting so much stress and pressure on us to get things done and to get it done yesterday and this and that, we have to make sure we draw the line with them. You guys, I'm always telling you who, who, who is my tribe? Who is my people? The, and I'm uh hydroflask is not sponsoring this. Um, the, um, water carrying the stainless steel, water carrying messy bun, Silly rock star t shirt, yoga pants, wearing iced coffee, driving a minivan, people. Those are my, that's my tribe, that's my people, right? Now, they might have a minivan because they, um, they've got children, or they could have a minivan because they are always on the hunt for roadside treasures. Okay. So, what I mean is, I have an eclectic group of people that are always either needing the deal because they need to be near the school district or they're looking for such a deal because they want to rebuild the interior of the house with roadside treasures, ergo my TikTok, right? So there, there, there's this group of people. Now, if you're working and you're working 80 hours and all of your listings are multi-million and your clients want an answer yesterday, they want you to know they're calling before the phone rings and all of that. You can see where negligence might come into play. You can see where all of that comes into play. So this class that we're in right now, or you're about to go, some of you are about to go in, some of you are in this class, and some of you are leaving the practice class, the practice prerequisite course. This is where you figure out who your niche and your community is and your, and your market is. Your community is everybody in your community, but who your sphere of influence is. And if you're a person that has grammatical errors on the daily and possibly has your PowerPoints not always make sense after you think you've read through them 1,500 times, 
uh, ergo I, you might find that the people that are the multi-million dollar in the multi-million dollar range are not necessarily my people. Um, and, and you need to find out who your people are and you have to come to a level. You always need to, um, exceed expectations. But what I'm trying to say is if you have someone that's constantly on your back, pushing and pushing and pushing you, chances are you can make mistakes is what I'm trying to say. You're not purposely omitting something. You're not going to purposely be negligent, but you might be really tired. The client might be running you ragged. You need to make sure that first and foremost, the people that you work with and the clientele that you initially seek after, because they're you're going to get other people too, initially seek after are people that can understand that at say 7.30 is when we're going to have a hard out, right? That at 7.30, done and done. We are done. I, I totally love you guys. And I want the best for you. And I want the best for your family, but I'm out. And it's not going to hurt anyone's feelings because the people I work with understand the way I work. And I want you to find out who those people are. So all of that being said, negligence happens. So we need to dial back the, uh, the, as much work as we're doing and calm, simmer down now, right? And find out why is it that I missed this? Why did I not dot that I or cross that T? Because you're, you're cruising. My mom would say, you're cruising for a bruising. My mom never bruised me. But um, there's a lot of sayings that are not PC now that sometimes I say in class. But um, that being said, we don't want to err. We don't want to be in such a position that we're, 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 we're Steve McQueen in directly into negligence because of being tired or being overworked or being overstimulated by everything else that's going on in life and us missing something. So let's look at the example. If an agent is listing a property and there is a question regarding the zoning, the agent should contact the zoning office. Now that's like a standard, just call the zoning office. Hey, escrow and title, absolutely. We work with escrow and title, contact escrow. Hey, like this should be a single family residence property, right? Yeah, why? I'm, I, I wanna list it, but it looks like it's coming up like multi-use or something like that. Can we get Joe? I'm always talking about Julie and escrow because I had this amazing escrow agent back in the day and her name is Julie. Her name's still Julie, beautiful woman. And then Joe at title. Joe, I can't remember the guy's name that at the title office that I used to work with, but he was just so good in it to win it. Okay. So, hey, Jules, do you know what's going on? Mm, no, that's, you know what? Let's get Joe in here. And because I was working in Northern California at that time, title and escrow were under the same roof. Now in Southern California, they're under separate roofs. I'm airing like South, <laughs> uh, Southern California is this way. I'm in Southern California. Okay, contact the title company. Your title company is gonna give you the opportunity to have an account with them to go and look at property profiles and the like. You should be able to pull this information up. It's only 2023, y'all. You should be able to pull this information up actually on your own. If there is a zoning concern, or if there's a question about title, if there's a cloud on title, if it does not have marketable title, we've got to get it marketable so we can hook up the client with the top price based on the comparative market analysis. Yes, market analysis, the country music words, you got this. Phone call, check a website, do a smidge of an email. You know what I'm saying? You just got to dash this and dash that. Absolutely. So if an agent knows about the zoning, it did nothing, the agent could be found guilty of negligence, right? Liable for damages incurred. And you're like, well, what are you talking about? Okay. For those of you that were in the class where we started talking about lawsuit, actually a couple of you, a couple of my classes are moving into that prerequisite um, class, the legal aspects class, right? And I want to encourage you, if you're looking to get into real estate and you're not sure what your third class should be, because you're required to take practices and principles, but for those of you that did not yet sign up for your third class, you should be signing up for legal aspects. Why? Because you have 12 options of, of any of the classes available with the Department of Real Estate. The only thing is legal aspects kind of touches on all 12 subjects where if you take the escrow class, it's going to hyper-focus on escrow. If you take the property management class, it's going to hyper-focus on that. If you take the appraisal class, it's going to, you know, or and there's... 12 um, options. I don't actually know what all of them are. I, I'm just going to push you for legal aspects. That one is going to help hone your skills on consumer driven law because that's what's going to help you pass that state exam. Okay, dialing it back. Let's get back to negligence. Okay. 
So if the, if the agent knew about um, a property, had a client go, hey, can you find me a piece of land? Because I'd like to build um, a homeless shelter or I'd like to um, do something else for the community. Let's say a homeless shelter. That sounds kind of cool. So you're like, yeah, no problem. And you're looking for property and you're like, man, I found a warehouse and you just have to put walls up and it's all the things. And the client's like, that sounds exact. That sounds perfect but it's industrial or light industrial. It's not, it's not zoned for housing. It's not zoned for human habitation. Um, that's what they're talking about with the zoning concern. Does that help? Okay. And, and so for, you, for those of you that are like, well, why would, we're, if it's not residential, what is it? Yeah, so we're talking about maybe a client that's looking for something specific. I need at least an acre. I need this, I need this, I need this. You're like, oh, I found the perfect property. And then you find, that not only is there a zoning concern or there's a zoning concern, but there's other concerns as well. There's some type of restrictions associated with that property. That's why that property is still available. And you can request a variant, exactly, a variance on zoning, but you're gonna have to pay for the application and you're gonna have to pay for the request. And even though you're given your good hard earned money to the, the, the local authorities, the city or the county, they don't have to accept what it is that you're wanting to do. Okay. And we, yes. And we, yeah, we talk about that. And, and we, we talk about that actually in each class, we have at least one example. So when it comes to this negligence, you're, when you're found guilty, it's considered fraud, right? Misrepresentation and negligence are considered fraud. The owner, if we are doing this and we're listing the property and the buyer is finding that we're having these issues, uh, and, and, and we have been found negligent, the seller of the property could be wrangled into this, even if they did not know that the, the information had, that, they, that there had been misinformation presented. It could cause them to be part of the rodeo and they don't like ride horsing, riding horses or bulls. Okay, all right. So let's talk about puffing. I like this image and it says um, they're willing to throw in their kidneys. So that lets you know the people that are selling this property really need to sell it, right? It's a lot of sarcasm and it's a lot of half truths, but they're not, it's not all out fraud. Puffing's an exaggeration of a fact. Um, and I have actually been at listings at open houses when I walked in and you know the agent there's like, welcome to this fabulous four bedroom, two bathroom, huge property. It's a 2,100 square foot um, uh, um, lot with an 1,800 square foot property. And there's room for the dog run in the backyard and there's po po potential for a pool. And you're like, the house is 1,800 square feet. It's on a 2,100 square foot lot and there's room for a pool, like a kiddie pool. Like what do you, so there's some exaggeration, if you will, that goes with puffing. They're like, well, you know, you could just kind of like put it on the roof or, you know, and you're like, um, hmm, what else are you pulling on me, bro? So puffing is one of those things where it could come off like a, a sarcastic. It could come off um, as just like trying to be appealing and funny. But in reality, yes, it's going to cause people to question if you're ever telling the truth. So you got to be really careful with puffing, but a lot of times you'll see puffing in advertisement. So you'll see these listings online on the multiple listing service or just your standard realtor.com, redfin.com, zillow.com. And it's like, come see this, um, um, uh, um, what is it, ostentatious, you know, this or that curbside, blah, blah, blah. And you, you drive by and, and it does have, it ha it cur with curbside appeal and you drive by, it does not have curbside appeal there's a really beautiful property up the street and I was walking the dog and I saw that they had an open house sign and I'm always, you know, in these classes and stuff. And I'm always looking at like, how do people market things? And this house in particular had these beautiful wildflowers and I'm just looking at the time. Sorry, guys. And they were two or three feet tall um, in their, their front yard on the one side. And then um, the house is like four tiers and the first tier has the same beautiful flowers. And then it's tiered all the way up because it's a, it's a property that's sloping on the other side of the hill from us. And I just remember going, wow, that looks so beautiful. Like they did such a great job. And then um, in, on the other side of the street, it's beautiful. It's Gorgina, right? But on that side of the street, it had thistles and it had a lot of other plants that were not flowers in those beds. And so... Um, 
I was just thinking about how um, the things that we see in a picture and the things we see in person are not necessarily the same thing. So you're going to see that advertisements online and then you get there, you're like, I thought they said there was an 1800 square foot house. Are, are they counting the patio in the back? You know, that kind of, yeah, exactly. You guys are doing great. Stigmatized properties. You guys know that I use this picture. I use this picture a lot. So that being said, stigmatized properties. So in real estate, this is not necessarily the same as what's in your book, but I like the way this has been written and I like to keep this one. Real estate agents must be careful when making disclosures about stigmatized properties. A stigmatized property as defined by the National Association of Realtors is a property that has been psychologically impacted by an event which occurred or was suspected to have occurred on the property or in the property, such event being one that has no physical impact of any kind, meaning there's, there's no remnants left over. So if there was a drive-by shooting and the holes are still in the wall, then, then of course there's some physical impact, but they don't, they mean structurally the house is not going to fall over. Those are things that can be patched, which sounds really um, cold, but you know, you, they can be. The most common properties associated with stigmatized properties are those in which there has been a murder, a suicide, multiple murders, illness, or even some type of criminal activity. So what do I, what are some of the other pictures? I use pictures from The Sopranos and Breaking Bad. Yes, so criminal activity. I'm not saying, I don't want to swim with, swim with the fishes. So I'm not going to say that's what's happening with Sopranos. I'm just going to say, if you watch it, hello. All right. Principals and clients may feel that the property is haunted, ba has bad luck, has some bad uh, uh, karma that goes along with it. And because it has these concerns, they're not going to be as interested in the property, ergo, if they feel in any way, shape, or form that you've lied to them about the property, they are going to, um, well, your license is on the line. There is no reason for you to not tell them about this. So um, this is actually, um, we're going to get over to contracts um, soon enough. This is my favorite building, uh, uh, the, the favorite style build of a home. And I remember we, um, just a real quick story, Adam and I were looking at this property and it was on half an acre and there was a foundational issue and I'd read up on what the foundational issue was and I had gone down to the building department and they had shared the things that would need to get done and what the estimated costs were. And I was like, you know, that's not about it. Like that does, that sound, that's totally still in our, uh, the potential, we could totally do this. And, um, there was enough space for that to be the ADU or the guest house. And then um, I wanted to build a house with this mansard roof, which is my favorite roof. And I just, I just remember the visually, I could visualize this, the top of the roof in this front window. And I was like, I just love this home. It reminds me of like the Adams family. It reminds me of um, the Munsters, both shows that were in black and white, I didn't see as a kid. I saw sometimes I saw the reruns, but there was just something about it that I just thought was so beautiful. And I remember Googling um, famous Mansard roof um, homes, um, you know, set, uh, Victorian um, era, um, Queen Anne, you know, trying to find it. And I saw the blueprints for this house and I was like, that's the house. And I showed it to Adam. He's like, okay. And I was like, no, I mean, it's so beautiful. And it's what I want. I want stonework. And I was like talking about it, whatever. And then I looked down and it was from psycho. So um, anyway, that being said, um, but it's still my favorite. Maybe not what happened in this house or the lady looking out the window that's not necessarily alive, but still in the rocking chair or the weird peepholes in the hotel or whatever. But yeah, it's my favorite. All right. So let's go. Let's talk about contracts. Let's talk about from the listing agent's perspective. Um, we're gonna do a case study for um, a listing agent and contracts. And we're gonna have time to go through this, but I wanna talk to you a little bit about, this is gonna be a far more in depth than us just talking about don't, don't commit fraud, right? 
So there are some learning objectives to this whole entire process. And I want you guys to take some notes. I want you to be able to identify the common forms included in a seller's listing package. Who's the seller? That's the owner of the property. We are listing the property for them. So the seller's listing package. Okay. So there would be uh, a, a set of disclosures required of the seller. Yes. Name the steps in disclosing agency relationship. And what is the first disclosure? Disclosure regarding agency relationship. Very good. It is the first disclosure that I need you to always give your client before any of the other disclosures. And the reason for that is all the California Association of Realtors forms are going to identify that based on the previous signature on that agency disclosure form, you or you should be aware that because you signed that, this is this. Now, I'm gonna, I always ask you, and I know you guys are like, I know the answer, Kathy. How would it make you feel if you were going through a contractual disclosure uh, or the contractual disclosure or contracts with someone and in the middle of, or at the very beginning of doing that contract, we see in there that you should have signed an, a, a, a different form prior to, and they're like, oh, don't worry about that one. We're only working on this one. Well, we're supposed to be building rapport with our clients, right? Are we building rapport at that point? No, we're, we're causing them to feel a little bit uneasy. And we're going to be going through multiple disclosures with them, 20 some odd disclosures. The um, agency disclosure statement basically lays out the foundation for what they should be expecting from you as an agent, that your fiduciary duty is to take care of them, that your due diligence is to make sure that you follow not only the law with the Department of Real Estate, but you also follow the National Association of Realtors um, ethics. You've got the California Association of Realtors. You have your local association. You've got this, the, the commissioner with the department. You know, So it really lays a strong foundation so that the client understands that you're serious about this and that you know what they need to do to be able to sell, to, to help them sell their home. And the moment we miss putting the disclosures in the right order, it's really that one. And then if you're going to list the property, then you list the property and then it's the transfer disclosure. And we can go on through those. But they're going to start going, okay, wait a minute. If you don't know which disclosure goes first, then how am I going to know that you're going to know how to open? It just opens such a can. We don't want to open Pandora's box. I want you to be successful. And that's why we're doing this. Um, we might uh, we might go to eight. I'm going to try not to go till eight o'clock. If you need to go, you guys can just jump ship. I totally get it. And for those of you that are going to leave before the Q&A at the end, I totally love that uh, for you. <clears throat> and if, especially if you have, I have class with you tomorrow morning at 8.30. I want you to have at least 12 hours between seeing me, you know. Okay. I want you to know how to complete typical seller's forms. Recall the importance of real estate property disclosures. And then for those of you that have yet to see Mystery Men, I just want you to know something. Disco is not dead, disco is life, okay? Here we go. So this is our case study. This is the fabulous Mr. and Mrs. Spring. They are a retired couple that lives in any city, Apple County. Their um, pastimes are wearing vintage clothes, ice skating, and wearing vintage, well, actually vintage everything. I love this picture. And I, I had a student ask me, how old do I think these people are? And I'm like, oh, they're probably my age. <laughs> it was a tough time back when this image was taken. And if you look back at like in the 50s, the 60s and the 70s, people that are in their late 40s do, don't look like people in their late 40s now. I'm in my, uh, I'm not in my late 40s. I'm in my last 40. I'm in, I'm 49. Okay. So this is Fred and Jan Spring. They have a single family detached house in the Hillside Ranch subdivision. Not sure why the font is a little bit off or the, it's okay. It is 1652 Hill Street, any city, Apple County. It is, and now legal description, right? Lot two, block 30 of Hillside Ranch. as shown on page 875 of book 465 of the records of Apple County. And then we also have the parcels number, which is 9Q, sorry, PQ9856. Okay, I think you can read it. This is their beautiful home. 
they are in what is considered a community or a gated community. And I'm going to share, we're going to do some world building. They live in what looks like a really small house, but it's actually, that's just the front and it goes and it just kind of meanders around. There are no fences in this area because they do live on a golf course. Um, and it is a gated community. So pretty much everything kind of lives free. Um, so if there's deers or anything else, everybody's just going to have to just uh, chill for a moment till the deers pass and that kind of, okay. Their homeowners association dues are 209 a month. Their annual property taxes are 3360. They have current liens on the property of $155,485. Um, and they have some amenities included. Now this beautiful home, I don't have pictures of the inside has a very cute vintage kitchen with new appliances that look retro, but they're brand spanking new. So they're energy efficient. You know how California loves you to be energy efficient. And they're going to leave the side-by-side -side refrigerator as well as the gas range because they are built into the kitchen looking very custom and cute. Um, the homeowner, um, Fred, totally knows his house is worth 435000 um, but we, as the agent or as the representative of the brokerage, know that because of the comparative market analysis uh, analysis that was done on the property, the house is probably worth between four ten and four twenty five. What's the reason for them listing the property? Well, they are not only just moving out of state; they're going to go move to the Netherlands, where they can skate off into all of the things they're going to skate off. Hopefully, the Netherlands have ice. So I apologize if I'm saying the wrong thing. All right, let's answer the first question together. As a reminder, the comparative market analysis gives the information to help set an appropriate listing price. Ergo, unit review right there, okay. Let's see if we can answer the first question together. In order to help the seller set an appropriate listing price, a salesperson must prepare A, a, sell, uh, a seller's listing package, B, comparative market analysis or the CMA, C, agency disclosure, or D, none of the above. In order to help the seller set an appropriate listing price, a salesperson must prepare A, a seller listing package, B, comparative marketing analysis, C, agency disclosure, or D, none of the above. What do you think? Yeah, it's a comparative market analysis. You guys did great. So before going to the listing for Fred and Jan, right? Pat, who's Pat Green, who's the agent, we're gonna pretend like we're Pat Green. Okay, Pat prepares a competitive, mar a competitive or a comparative market analysis to show the springs, what houses are going for in the area. This information is going to help them set an appropriate listing price. So question that's not on, the, that's not on here. When we get a comparative market analysis, how many months out should it be? How far out from the property should it be? What do you guys think? I like that. Standard is six months, absolutely within a half mile radius. But if we're in a gated community, like we know that the Springs are, um, finding out what other listed properties are selling for will help benefit us for finding the value in his, their their actual community. And so because their community is eclectic and it's a golf course and it's a couple other things, and most of the houses are custom, we might have a little bit of a hiccup with finding value. So we're going to have to do what? Do you guys don't remember? I'll see if I can pull it up. I want you guys to pull it up. You know what? I'm going to make that the assignment. Let me see if I can here. I'll see if I can find what page it's on so you guys can find it. Yes, they are 
trying to find similar or similar, right, comps. I know I have it. Why is it? Yes, sales comparison approach. So thank you. I almost, okay, so you know where it is. I want you to put it in the chat. Sales comparison approach. So before going to the listing appointment, Pat prepares a competitive market analysis and lets them know in the neighborhood. So if Fred were to come to us and say, hey, because we're Pat, right? Hey, um, so I don't know where you got that price. You could say, well, based on the sales in your area and the, and the comparison of those, there's an adding and a subtracting for different things to find the value. Very good. Okay. So I know this looks like a famous director that might have directed one of the Superman movies. And I know this looks a little bit like Clark Kent, but the reality of the situation is this is Pat Green. We're going to be acting as though we're Pat Green. And who's the agent on the file? It's the broker. Tom Baker is the broker. He's the broker for Pat Green, who we will be acting as though we're presenting as Pat Green. For Sunshine Real Estate, the address is also in any city and it's on 1234 Mountain Road. We have a phone number, we have a fax number, and we have an email address. Notice it's for the broker and not for Mr. Green, but that's okay too. So Pat Green gets the listing from the Springs, or we get the listing from the Springs if we're going to st stand in the shoes of Pat Green, right? It's for three months. The property's listed for $415,000 with a 6% commission. But Fred and Jan are so sure this property is going to sell like this that they're like, hey, we'll give you an additional 1% for offering the exact terms of the listing and close within 30 days. The so home is in excellent condition, but Fred and Jan have also said, you know what? If you find anything or anything's found, we could do a home inspection. We'll pay up to $1,000 for any work to be done, but we know the home is in beautiful condition. Ergo, the beautiful picture we saw, right? So I would venture to say they're right. Um, the amenities that are going to stay with the property are the side-by-side -side refrigerator and the gas range. And we talked about that um, in a previous slide, but it's still true. And it's going to, part of the reason we're doing kind of a refresh on some of these things is we're going to start seeing it in the contract itself. So description of the property. It's a 1990, 1750 square foot home with four bedrooms, two bathrooms, a living room, formal dining room, kitchen, and family room in excellent condition on a cul-de-sac. There is a potential addition um, for a room off of the unfurnished attic that's accessible from the master closet. That can either be an amazing um, home DIY moment, or that's going to be the start to a very scary movie. It's one or the other. Okay. So what was one of the things that we talked about like 15 minutes ago? Every agency has what? Principal, agent, and third party. Absolutely. You need to know it's principal, agent, and third party. Um, so in this particular uh, real estate transaction that we're working with, uh, Pat, Fred and Jan, we're technically Pat Green, right? The principal's Fred and Jan. The agent is who? Tom Baker's the broker. He's the agent. And then we represent the brokerage as well as the client. We are Pat Green. And then there's the third party. We don't have, we don't know who the customer or the third party is as of yet. We have, we could, we could totally do dual agency. Absolutely. 
All right, let's see if we can answer the next question together. Every single agency, excuse me, every single agency relationship has A, agent, B, principal, C, third party, or D, all of the above. What do you think? Every single agency relationship has an agent, a principal, a third party, or all of the above. What do you think the answer is? You guys are doing great. Every single agency relationship has a principal, an agent, and a third party. A dual agency would have one agent, absolutely, and two principals. There wouldn't be a third party because we would be representing, or our brokerage would be representing both principals. Very good. So is the broker the agent? We know the broker is the agent. Why did I put it in all caps? Because that's how I do, right? Um, the agent for the seller or the buyer is always the licensed real estate broker. At this moment in time, it's for the seller. We know that it's Tom Baker. And the salesperson is never the agent. Um, always a bridesmaid, never a bride situation, right? In some respects. Okay. So the salesperson would have would work on behalf of their broker. And these are things we've already said, but I'm going to say them again, because one thing you know about me is repetition equals retention, and I am repetitive. Salespeople work on behalf of their broker. When a broker represents only a buyer or a seller in the transaction, that's considered a single agency. And that's just like agency, but you can call it single agency. But the reason we call it single agency is because if it's not in single agency, right? Yes, it is dual agency. So the broker obtaining the listing, which would be our broker, because we are Pat Green and we're representing the broker. The broker who gets the listing always acts as the agent for the owner of the property. Now, does broker Baker know Fred and Jan? Chances are they don't. Pat Green did all of the prospecting to get this principle to, and to get this listing, right? So broker Baker might be aware that that listing is coming in and going out, but chances are they, the, the broker never knows your client. These are your clients, but on contractual law in the state of California, the broker is the agent. Very good, very good. So the listing agent, a listing agent is a broker who obtains a listing from a seller to act as an agent for compensation, right? Compensation. They're doing it to make it rain, baby. They're trying to get some money, honey. Okay. A listing is a contract between the owner of real property and an agent who is authorized to obtain a buyer. What's another way of saying that? Procuring cause. Absolutely. Trying to get this deal done, right? Okay. Good job. I don't know. I'm snapping a lot. I'm a snapper. I'm a snapper. All right. Um, where are, oh, I went one too far. Okay, broker obtaining the offer. So we have the broker obtaining the offer. The broker obtaining the offer is often called the cooperating broker or the selling agent. Why are they called the selling agent, ladies and gentlemen? Because they're getting it sold, right? I know that there's a listing agent. A lot of times people call the listing agent the selling agent, but basically... The cooperating broker is getting, is the procuring cause, most of the, the selling agent, right? The buyer's agent, they're bringing in the buyer, they're getting this thing cooking, good looking. Okay, so a selling agent is the broker who finds a buyer and obtains an offer for the property or for the real property, because it's all real property, unless it's personal and you can't sell personal property as real estate, unless it's hardwired into the, good job, hardwired in. Buyer's agent is, an, is, the broker's, uh, is the broker employed by the buyer to locate a certain kind of property. So they're also pro the procuring cause, right? So basically a buyer's agent is a buyer that came to you or a potential person that's looking to buy a house comes to you and is like, hey, I really would like to find the house from um, Despicable Me. I'm such a fan of Groot. And um, if you can find me a house that looks like that, I'll just paint the outside with flat, flat black paint. You're like, oh my gosh. I want to help you paint that house. I'd love, I'd love to hear what your neighbors have to say about that. Okay. Subagent is a broker delegated by the listing agent, if authorized by the seller, which it would be, who represents the seller in finding the buyer for the listed property. So those are all the T's and the D's, right? The terms and the definitions or the term and def. Okay. 
So we got that going for us. Um, a dual agent is a broker who represents both the seller and the buyer in the same transaction. So the reason I'm saying in the same transaction is I've had people say, well, I'm a dual agent. I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, um, sometimes I list houses and then sometimes I have buyers that are looking for houses. And I was like, oh, that just, that's cool. Um, I thought dual agency was associated with the fact that you represented both the buyer and the seller in the same listing or in the same, on that same property. And they're like, oh, is that what that means? You know, a lot of, instead of saying, that's not what that means. You can go, man, I thought that it meant this. What, what do you think? Dual agency? Wait, so what is it that you could be a buyer's agent? You could be a listing agent. You could be someone that prefers to only list properties. You could be someone who prefers to only show properties. But nine times out of 10, you're going to have a client come back to you because they loved working with you and they're going to be on the other side of things. And um, I want to encourage you to always work with the people you've worked with before that come back and want to work with you because you're, you built that rapport with them for return clientele. Even though every single deal we go through, we need to think about it as 30 years of the rest of their life. And it's a commission for us this month or next month or whatever, right? But it's 30 years of the rest of their life. They're making a 30 year commitment to that property because the most of the loans are 30 year fixed, right? And I'll always talk to you about getting a 30 year fixed, pay it off in 10, pay it off in 15, pay it off in 20, pay it forward. We'll talk about different clauses. Um, as time progresses with class. Those of you that have gone through clauses with me for, before, you know we're going to circle back because that's something we definitely do in this class. So let's get to the first disclosure. We're two minutes away from class needing to go. Well, well let's just, let's see, let's see what we can get done in the next two minutes because we'll go. Let's do 7.30. I got the census. You're like, oh man, Kath. No, no, it's okay. We'll hit the ground running again tomorrow, okay? I, not tomorrow per se, unless you're in my class tomorrow night. <laughs> um, and if you're in my class tomorrow night, we're going to kind of go over some of the same stuff. So this, you're going to be ahead of schedule. Okay. So disclosure, uh, disclosing agency relationships. So this has only been around since 1988. It's no big one. Its purpose is to clarify agency relationship between the seller, the agent, and the buyer. It's basically going, hey, this is how contractual law works when it comes to real estate. And this is what the person that's going to list the property is supposed to do for you. This is what the person who is representing the buyer is supposed to do for you. And then this is what the person who does both of those jobs is going to do for you. And you should expect it. That's the law. The state requires that each of these jobs are as such. And it's detailed on this disclosure statement. So you can definitely see why I've been pushing really hard on disclosure regarding agency relationship. It sets the scene. So if you've ever written script, uh, any type of, it, it's, it's, it's the cold open on um, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, or it's the cold open on Veep, or it's the cold open on pretty much any show, if you're watching any shows on um, the World Wide Web. Um, it sets the scene for the rest of, now cold open just kind of is a funny scene, and it doesn't really set the scene for the, what's going to come, but it does set the emotional, like what's coming emotionally. And so I want you guys to know that that disclosure agency uh, relationship disclosure is setting the scene with your client. Is it building rapport? Is it breaking down trust? Is it building trust? What is it doing? What is it doing? That's a good question. Let's see if we can answer another question. Which of the following is a dual agent or which of the following is a dual agency? A, the broker is representing only a buyer. B, a broker is representing only a seller. C, a broker is representing both the buyer and the seller. Or D, a principal is represented by a listing agent and a buyer's agent. What do you think? Yes. Absolutely. See, a broker is representing both the buyer and the seller. A dual agency exists if one broker represents both principles. One broker represents both principles. Very good. All right. When it comes to the agency uh, relationship and disclosure, as a licensee, you must use the agency regarding real estate agency uh, relationship form explaining the nature of the agency, what we just kind of talked about, right? This is the first disclosure presented always, always, forever, amen, 
pass, go get your 200 bucks and keep going on that monopoly, um, um, uh, game. Okay. Seriously, please make sure that this is the first disclosure, whether your client is having you list the property with them or whether you have a client that's interested in having you help them find a home or put together a purchase agreement and join escrow instructions. Please make sure this is the first thing that you talk through and have them sign. The law is very clear about your responsibility for full disclosure. Ergo, this is what everybody's doing. And this is why I am going to take care of you through all of this. This is a contractual agreement. Your principal has hired you, employed you to work for them in their best interest and in the best light for them to protect them for the next 30. It's basically protecting them for the next 30 years. All right, it is 7.30, we're gonna go. I'm gonna ask you one other, we'll come back to this exact, we'll come back to slide 20 um, or 19, I think it is. Um, so how many, what's the statute of limitation on real estate contracts? Do you guys know what it is? What's the statute of limitation on real estate contracts? Okay. Interesting. Okay. I want you to look it up and I want you to be ready for class next Wednesday, or you can ask, you can tell me tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening, depending upon what classes I still have with you this week. And for those of you that are prepping for your open book exam, I'm so glad you came. I want you to know that I believe in you and you've got seven days to knock it out of the park. And I know you can do it. I know you can do it. Okay. I believe it's four years. The statute of limitations is four years. Now I could be wrong. And what happens if I'm wrong? I owe you a cup of coffee. I will send you a gift card. If you live in town, I'll take you. Okay. So all that being said, I want you to be blessed and encouraged. It's 732. I believe in you. I know you can, if I can pass the state exam, you can pass the state exam. If I can be a successful real estate agent. And what I mean by that is close at least one deal. <laughs> you can be a successful real estate agent. Okay. I'm a text message away. I'm a phone call away, I'm an email away, I'm a Zoom away, I'm a message in the, uh, you know, in the comments away from helping you master the next step in your real estate experience, okay? I'll see you soon. We'll talk soon. Wait, I'm looking for Baba Ganoush. Nope, she is not willing to come over and say bye. Usually she is. Okay, we'll see you soon. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great evening. Good morning, good evening, and good night.